the first round of, of questions. Um, if Okay, I see Councilor Menard has his hand in there too. So uh, we can go after Teresa, we can go to Sean and then to you, and then we'll start the second round. Okay. Okay, ready? Yeah. Okay, ready. thanks. Yeah, uh, Councillor Kavanaugh, I believe everybody's uh, back here. If you, you wanna go ahead with your questions. Sure, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. There's been some excellent questions and very in-depth. Um, I'm looking at it from a layperson's uh, point of view in terms of the overall picture and, and people wonder how is it this uh, new system is, is having issues when we had a trillium line there for 10 years that did not have any problems. Is it related to the fact that we've got a system with a, I mean, it's multi, there's multiple chain differences, uh, a brand new train, um, but I expect there was a brand new train when the Trillium started, but also the fact that there's curves in the system. What are, what uh, would you say about those comparisons? Uh, you know, maybe I, go ahead, Mr. Chair, go ahead. Yeah, I just want to say if you want to take that one. Uh, yes, yes, Mr. Chair, um, you know, they, the, the, the two systems are very, very different. Um, you know, the, the, the Confederation line, line one, it, you know, is, is an electric system, computer-based train control, um, you know, low floor vehicles, um, you know, and, and we are dealing with, um, you know, a vehicle that is new. It, it's, it's the first kind, first type, and, um, you know, we're dealing with some of those, those, those challenges with, with an initial new vehicle. Um, you know, the Trillium line, um, you know, when it, when we launched after the expansion, you know, we did uh, have some challenges in the early days, um, but we were able to resolve those, those challenges, um, you know, more quickly than what we're seeing on, on line two. But, you know, there were, there were some challenges, day, challenging days of uh, the winter particularly was challenging, but the vehicles on, on line two were, um, were, were established vehicles, um, they, you know, that were part of a, a longer production line as opposed to a newer vehicle. So, very, very different systems, um, and uh, you know, you know, definitely, um, you know, to your point on curves, um, you know, you, you have to manage, you know, track and trains differently on curves, and you know that does pose some challenges. But um, you know, it, it's it's not let, unlike that, um, you know, there aren't curves in other transit systems and other networks, so it's just something that needs to be managed and and um, you know, need, and it needs to be um, you know, make sure you have the right mitigations in place. But two very, very different systems. Um, and, uh, you know, but I think one of the, the main issues that we're dealing with on, on line one right now is, is, uh, the vehicle reliability issues. Okay. Um, did it have, a, did they have a gearbox, um, on the Trillium line the same way is, was that ever an issue? Um, not, you know, the, 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 the Trillium line trains, they're, they're, they're diesel trains. So, you know, the propulsion systems are very, very different than what you'd see on, on the, on the, on the light rail system that we have now. It, it's on, it really is comparing apples to oranges. Um, but, you know, we did have some vehicle challenges, but not to the extent that we're seeing on line one right now. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Councillor Kavanaugh. So next up will be Council Menard. Thanks very much, Chair. Um, thank you for the presentations today. I wanted to start with Paratranspo. Um, I know that they're also, uh, those uh, trips are also suffering um, during this disruption. And so I'm wondering if staff can go into some more details. Um, do we have enough drivers? Are we meeting a demand with the vehicles that we have? Uh, what is our, our plan to improve paratranspo service uh, during the current disruption that we're seeing? Thanks, Mr. Chair. I can provide some information to answer some of those questions. Um, we are continuing to accommodate all paratranspo trip requests um, and paratranspo ridership is still uh, lower uh, than it would normally be because of the pandemic. I'm just scanning a page we've got here. Um, in the month of September, paratranspo ridership was at 55% of pre-pandemic levels. Um, in the first half of October, uh, so going up to the 15th, but excluding Thanksgiving Day, paratransfer ridership was at 58% of pre-pandemic levels. 
so first of all, we are we continue to uh, have more capacity than uh, than ridership, and therefore space to accommodate everybody. And you'll see in a um, in the performance presentation that will come after this item that um, even at full ridership, we've been able to accommodate substantially all customers in recent years. Um, the second aspect is that we've um we're continuing for the the sake of uh comfort and social distancing we're continuing to uh, as much as possible try to have uh, only one customer at a time when the trip's being provided by a taxi and that uh, in the month of september there were there was never more than one customer um we do in some cases a very small number of cases um it looks like it's, uh, no, I don't have that number exactly. Uh, in very small number of cases, we do have more than one customer on board when it's when the trip's being provided by a minibus. Uh, traffic um, is still below, auto traffic is still below pre-pandemic levels and therefore paratranspital buses are, are running on time at a higher rate than they would normally. So the effect on Customers with disabilities, I'd say, is that uh, because of the um, O train suspension, is that people who have a disability but find it possible to um, make their trip satisfactorily when the train is running, but can't do that when buses are running, have at this point moved back to paratranspo and are back into the um, all of the compromises that they're familiar with um, that, uh, that come with needing to pre-book and, uh, and needing to uh, be ready for the bus to come and all, all of the compromises that are there with paratranspo service that the people who are uh, still using paratranspo um, experience all the time. So I would suggest that when we hear about people uh, dissatisfied with paratranspo service, it's really a dissatisfaction that they need to go back to paratranspo service uh, and that they're back to the same compromises that they used to live with uh, and, ex and uh, I won't say accept, but know was part of their uh, their journey before the O-Train opened. Okay, yeah, this is certainly having an effect on, on everybody in the city. Um, uh, there's been a request that I've seen and come through through our office and other offices that um, paratranspo uh, service be a regular standing item on the agenda. And I just, I want to reiterate that request and to ensure that uh, we do that. that. That should be updated every single transit commission meeting, um, just as we've been updating on, <clears throat> on uh, your bu the, the bus service and uh, our transit lines, we should be having a, a separate paratransport item um, that is separated out uh, every single transit commission meeting, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm wondering, I'm following up on the UPASS question that was asked previously. Uh, we asked about free transit in December, if that can still happen or not, depending on when we actually get back. And I'm doubtful we can get back to full service by December, but uh, on the UPASS, uh, how, how will students be refunded for free transit for that month? Mr. Chair, we will be, uh, we've started discussions, we will discuss more with the universities and the college that are on the UFAS program, how they will administer that. Our contractual relationship for all of those is with the university and the college and they, uh, they have the relationship with the individual students with the UFAS. So we'll be arranging the best method possible to provide, a, whether it's a credit or a refund or a, a smaller billing on a future bill. Uh, to get that money back to the universities and college and we'll be asking them if they can give us information that we can share with our customers on how they're refunding that money or supplying that credit back to their students okay thank you the, the earlier with that information the better i uh, appreciate that um, assuming we get a partial return of service whenever we get that um, will we still run some R1 buses when we have the partial return of service. I, I, I'm sorry, I'm just changing microphones. I hope that sounds better. Um, Sound good. 
as the it'll depend on and i and i'm expecting that this will be a gradual return to service of more and more vehicles that will start at the, the level that mr uh, gary describes and that they will gradually return up to full service i wouldn't want to guess at how long that takes but i expect that it's not an instant thing it, it happens over a period of time um, what we're going to do during that period of time is start from the expectation that we will need to still have some bus service there as a supplement to the rail service, but the rail service switches back as soon as it's back of being the spine of the network and most people's first choice. Uh, we'll make sure we've got enough buses to accommodate uh, anyone who chooses to ride bus rather than train. We'll make sure we've got enough buses to accommodate any uh, overflow of customers who, who the limited train service wouldn't have capacity for but over that time, whatever that time is, uh, we'll be looking for the first available opportunity to reduce the number of buses that we have to commit to the replacement bus service and move them back to be able to restore some of the trips on the other routes across the system that we've had to cancel since late September. And that's that's primarily my concern is is the routes that have been canceled. I see line two. Uh, you're muted, Councillor. Oh, am I am I better now? Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we can, can hear, hear me, Mr. Scrimger? I don't know who said that, uh, Sean. Sorry. Okay. Uh, well, Mr. Scrimger had mentioned it. I maybe his microphone switch had an issue. I did. I I couldn't hear okay. anything anyone was saying once I switched to my new my proper microphone. Okay. Okay. Good. Uh, I think we're back on here. So um, that is my main concern. Is I, I see the cancellations of Route Seven. Um, I see the cancellations of line two. Those are our two top cancellations to supplement the R1. And those are two uh, routes that are heavily used in the core of the city, uh, along Bank Street, a lot of Carleton students. Uh, so this is a, a big concern uh, for me and, and those uh, routes that have been canceled. Um, so I wanna reiterate the, the need uh, to restore that, that service. Um, I wanted to go, um, to this will be my last my last points I suppose um, we've heard and seen um, you know the following issues we've seen Alstom say we need an uplift in service and and Councillor McKenney has pointed that out today that after two years we're we're seeing that line um, we've we've seen RTG's inability to really get concentrated resources when we needed them for previous fixes. Uh, we have seen uh, the lack of information being divulged to the public as a result of the, the supposed partnership we're in here. And we know that, you know, RTG is essentially a shell corporation, uh, which limits potential liability and, and clouds accountability. And so I'm wondering to the city manager and, and, and to others, when we're going to hear um, an admittance that this, this was a mistake with the system that, that we made errors in, in purchasing brand new untested trains, that mistakes were made in allowing for a truncated testing period and subsequent launch. I, I want to know when we're going to hear about the, the failure to account for P3 factors, such as the, the large cost of litigation, which is not included in those original calculations, uh, the cost to our residents of long-term trust issues, and we know declining modal share that results, that is so difficult to get back over the long term. Uh, I want to know when we're going to hear uh, an admittance from our, our city staff that the, the risk that we were put in you know, by allowing a 30-year maintenance contracts in this way with no competition, that risk was baked in. Uh, or the way you know, we've seen uh, that the track was designed because I, I hear plenty of blame to go around, but I haven't heard really words of accountability from our staff or the mayor that the city made multiple mistakes, which unnecessarily increased uh, our risk while more than doubling the municipal debt load and really, quite frankly, shirking responsibility by you know, torpedoing a, a judicial inquiry into the process. So I, I don't see that accountability. So I wonder today if we can hear that accountability, that those mistakes were made, that this is not just RTG, there's city issues here that of the way this system uh, has been procured. 
And I'd like Fine. to hear that today. Well, Councillor, you know, you made more of a, a you know, a, a statement, a political statement, and you're asking me a question to basically characterize an entire system that um, started in 2010, the procurement process. Every step of the way, Council was involved. Um, we had IO involved. We had experts involved. And for me to be able to say that this was a mistake, you've got to be able to compare it to something else and what the alternative was. We've had issues with the system. Was it a mistake? We followed the procurement process at the time that was seen as best practice. We've had uh, audits that have said that it was best practice. We've had Auditor General review it that said that, that we followed the audits properly, KPMG. We had less to learn report. I mean, you know all that. But I'm not going to sit here and characterize simplistically um, the entire the entire process as something that was a mistake. Uh, that issues have happened. We've had to deal with issues. Um, our our, our uh, partners obviously have uh, have made a lot of mistakes in terms of how they set up their system, how they're maintaining, and what they're doing. But that doesn't necessarily flow from how we procured it and the decisions that were made by council and staff. We depended on this consortium to have the right processes, people, organizational structure, etc. Um, to be able to maintain the system uh, and uh, deliver what we paid for and what we were promised. So, you know, trying to find fault in that based on, on something that was done collectively, I'm not prepared to, uh, to say that categorically because it's much more nuanced and much more complex an answer than a simple answer, yes or no, we made a mistake. Okay, I just wanted to, well, thank you for that. I, I'm, I'm hoping for more in the future that we all need to admit that the city had fault in this. Uh, I wanted to welcome though, because uh, I'm very much looking forward to working with, with Ms. Amilcar. Uh, we really need you here. We're happy to have new leadership here and we're excited to see um, that working relationship to, to work towards a better future for this system and the city. And I think you represent that and uh, really appreciate that, that you're here with us. So. Uh, very much looking forward to working with you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Fleury, followed by um, uh, Commissioner Wright Gilbert. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Tout d'abord, uh, Madame Amilcar, bienvenue à, à notre ville. J'ai eu la chance de vous croiser à l'hôtel de ville hier, puis uh, je dois vous avouer que vous amenez une nouvelle énergie dans un, un moment turbulent uh, au niveau du transport en commun à Ottawa. Donc, uh, je vous souhaite uh, succès. Je nous souhaite succès et puis euh, sachez que vous avez euh, une équipe, euh, une équipe euh, quand même bien expérimentée. Puis j'espère que vous allez amener, amener votre, votre doigté sur, euh, sur les particularités des enjeux du système actuel. Donc, euh, bienvenue. Um, I have four questions and I want to thank colleagues. There's been a, I've been in and out, but following the various threads and I, I think it's very helpful to air and expose some of the, uh, the challenges. I want to maybe speak of the train issues, but then also speak of the replacement uh, buses issue. Um, maybe with the train, starting with the train one, and uh, I, I believe it's the organization, I think it's uh, Daniel who's here on behalf of TRA. Daniel, as a, as a someone that goes into these scenes and, and does the analysis and so on, do you have a general comment as it relates to the vehicles? Um, I don't know if you followed Ottawa in the past, but uh, it appears that a lot of the issues we're having on the rail often relate to the vehicle and systems of the vehicle. I, I don't know if you had a, I know you're doing a specific analysis on safety, but in that analysis, you would have had to do some deep dive into the vehicle itself. Would you have any specific comments to the vehicle aspects or the, the specs on the vehicle or um, the, the various uh, climate realities we have here in, in a capital city. Uh, good afternoon. Um, I, I don't at this point have a general comment on the on the vehicles or, or uh, um, the, the vehicle systems. Our work really has been focused specifically on uh, the root cause analyses associated with these two derailments and the safety management system. Uh, processes that that um, we talked about a little bit earlier. So um, that's that's really where our concentration has been. I, I, I don't know that I could comment on the on the vehicles overall. Okay, simply uh, maybe as a kind of a clarification point, we 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 hear it and we've heard it from uh, from riders. The trains vibrate, and we hear it if you're on the multi-use pathway along the train. 
we know that in stations, the station absorbs the vibration, which, which limit uh, a lot of those impacts. When you get out of that and you do, and I think Teresa was talking about the curves and the vibration, it's pretty apparent that that vibration is felt through the vehicle, which would have a number of impacts on the wheels, a number of impacts on the various systems. So is, does that, is that forming part of your analysis? Because we want to get to root causes. I know you, you have a mandate to get to uh, safety and trains back on track. I think both are complementary to one another. And, and I, I, I really would love to hear from you in terms of vibrations, in terms of mitigations of that, and in terms of long-term risks that might uh, we might need to consider there. Sure. Um, so I think that that uh, there's um, we unfortunately are here, you know, sort of late in the in, in the process, so didn't have the chance to to witness some of those things, uh, you know, maybe firsthand, um, and and to uh, uh, to see some of those things happening for ourselves. But um, the the root cause analyses uh, are are um, certainly wide enough. The the analyses that that are getting to those root causes, I should say, are certainly wide enough to consider things like um, external environmental factors. Uh, design issues, um, the impact of of uh, outside uh, factors on on the bogies and on the wheel uh, and and bearing systems, um, and uh, as we we heard earlier those those root cause analyses are certainly um, still very much in in process at this point, uh, and I think that that um, we've seen some good information that that indicates that that uh, there are um, there are some causes that that. You know that seem seem more likely than than others, but but uh, I think that the process has been um, wider reaching and is considered uh, outside um, influences like that as well as uh, design issues and other factors. Okay, well I'll leave it at that for that. Uh, only the two pieces that I've raised is, I would raise is I hope that city staff or even your your organization can go onto social media because it's been actually quite well documented in videos and sound in terms of the vibration issues across the plot, across uh, this, this segment. So that would give you additional insight and maybe just a thought for the city manager and the OC team, the, uh, the uh, rail team to just maybe consider keeping the TRA on past opening if, if, if and when there is the safety compliance, just to get a fulsome analysis of these movements and vibrations and, and other risk factors as, as the team is mobilized on the ground and um, I'm here and committed to, uh, to getting it uh, in a safe environment. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chair, if, uh, if a TRA is agreeable, our plan is to keep them on beyond uh, the restart to continue on the checks and to bring them back regularly. Good, okay, thank you. Uh, maybe I'll turn to Pat now uh, or the team or Troy on, on the buses. So. I, I have a lot of, of, of ideas on what we could do for R1. You've heard earlier from delegations about Rideau Street and the movement on Rideau Street using McKenzie Bridge, I think really needs to be thought through and discussed with users and, 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 and further thought through and, uh, on, on longer term replacement. On shorter term, I understand the benefit of Rideau, but in, on longer term bus routes, I think it needs to be considered. Um, my, my specific question is when you remove line two, when you remove the 38, you, you're at 50%, you're at 49 something percent uh, of routes that go through my area. I'm the lowest income community in Ottawa. And, and Madame Amicard, just pour vous donner un contexte, Ottawa has this constant battle of running an amazing commuter transit system, Monday to Friday peak times and running a transit system for those who don't have a car and choose to ride the bus or the train. And I guess that's the tension that you're hitting now on the R1 is that you're stealing from local routes, having impact on local riders. And we've done the cuts on local routes. We went from 20, 15 minute riders, 15 minute gaps between buses to through the pandemic, those are 20, 30 minutes to now, uh, you know, additional cancellation. So, I don't know who's best to answer, but I guess my thought is what reflection, what policy environment does OC go in to decide, hey, these are the routes we should cancel. And, and I've, I've heard in the past saying ridership, but we, in my mind, we don't have real-time ridership. So I question that, uh, that spirit. 
that's time. So I can I can say a little bit, and I hope these comments are helpful. Um, as as you know, as we've talked about before, every we recognize that every time any service has to be reduced or cut for any reason, it is negative for the customers who use that service. There is nothing positive about a trip cancellation. There is nothing positive about a service reduction for a transit customer. Um, we have made we made reductions that uh, the councillor and I have talked about previously. Uh, back in the summer, in June, these were the ones to uh, reduce our operating cost uh, in response to the very low ridership uh, because of the pandemic. And then those, those went in, into effect in, in June. The changes that went into effect, the additional trips that we had to cut in September uh, were to make enough buses available so that we could accommodate everyone traveling on, on the R1 service. Uh, a, a basic concept that, you know, guides us there is if people, if people can't get to their local station because the core service isn't running, or if they, they can get to their local station and they can't go any further, then uh, we need more, more capacity on that core service, which is unfortunately and temporarily the R1 replacement bus service. But at the same time, we also recognize that there's uh, a great number of customers who don't travel on the train, don't, didn't travel on the transit way, don't travel on the train, don't travel on the R1 as part of their trip. And that might be someone who's traveling from uh, Vanier to the Rideau Center. Equally, it might be someone who's traveling from Canada to Merivale High School. These are all trips, and there's many, many examples like that, uh, of trips that need to be sustained because um, need to be sustained, even though there is this disruption on the on the core system, uh, because they don't they don't interact with it. But it's necessary for us to get enough buses to make sure that that core service can at least move the people, if not with any uh, sufficient speed or sufficient reliability. At least we can move the people. So that's the kind of thinking that guides us. That we know we have to get the buses available. But we also know that every service reduction is negative for the people it affects. And um, I think some members of the commission might remember that we brought a, you know, a policy oriented report on this topic earlier this year, explaining that tension, explaining that uh, whenever we need to do service reductions for whatever reason it is, this is the kind of thinking we have to have to go through. And this is the kind of analysis we have to apply. Uh, my optimism, my limited optimism for the future is that when the train comes back, as the train comes back, even if it's very limited in the early days, that will very quickly start to relieve the, the tension and the pressure uh, that, uh, that our customers on all of those routes are relieving. We will be able to, as the train comes back, it will give us capacity, it will give us connectivity, both of those will allow us to bring those buses back to the people who who should normally expect them to be serving um, their trips. So we look forward to that happening as soon as all of the technical arrangements that you've been hearing about can be in place. Thank you, Mr. Scrimger. Next up is Commissioner Wright Gilbert. Mr. Uh, Mr. Chair, I know my time's up. Could I just yeah. wrap com wrap up comment maybe to the transit commission on this? The uh, 15 seconds max. Okay, go ahead. I, I, I hope that the transit commission and the heads up to the budget really considers in, in long-standing cancellations like this, how do we how do we get the right R1 model in place? It it, it we really need to get this right in the, the spirit of challenges we're having on, on track. That'll be my only comment, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor Fleury. I think we're all in agreement on that as well. Uh, Commissioner Wright Gilbert, please. Followed Thank by Councillor McKenney. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I have a question for RTG. So the, the memo that uh, City Council and, and Commissioners received uh, regarding your return to service plan, though light on detail, did say that um, the partial return, that, that RTG expected a partial return to service on November 1st. However, during this meeting, I believe it was 
it may have been Mr. Guerra, but it could be Mr. Truchon, and I apologize, um, stating that the November 1st date is actually when the trains will be ready for testing. So which is it? Return to service on November 1st that you're, that you're projecting, or is it when they're ready for testing? Okay, I'll, I can take that, Mr. Chair. Um, so November 1st is when we expect to have seven plus one spare trains fully inspected, gone through the process. I think what I said, stated earlier was that in parallel, we are working with the city and TRA to ensure that we are providing the, the, the information that is required and, and possibly be able to test before November 1st. Um, but at this point, it, it, November 1st, we commit to having the trains available on November 1st. If we can do the, if the, the process to certify can be done uh, in parallel, then obviously that saves the amount of time that has to, we have to, have to put into the, to it afterwards. But I would expect uh, at least uh, testing would probably have to be done after, after November 1st. Okay, so, uh, okay. So essentially what you're saying is the trains will be available on the 1st, but not for actual customers to go on them. So that memo was a little bit, and it, you didn't write it, so it's fine. It was a little bit um, misleading. Right, in terms of customer expectations, I, I would say, right? Because all the headlines, I read that memo, I read it four times over because it had the shiny object at the beginning about the November 1st date and we think it might be the first two weeks of November and that's fine. But what you're saying uh, is that, uh, what RTG is saying is that the trains will be available for testing on the 1st, not necessarily for passengers. Mr. Chair, uh, what I'm saying, <laughs> Our target is to have seven plus one trains available on November 1st. If prior to that, the TRA and the city sign off on our processes, we can certainly do the testing, even if it's just with five or six trains prior to the November 1st date and then be ready to go on November 1st. But at this point, it's purely speculation. Uh, we need to work the process and ensure that we provide the city and TRA with the information that they're looking for to be able to do that. Mr. So Chair. there is a possibility that we could be in service on November 1st, although, although I, I, I admittedly, um, probably not. Mr. Go ahead, Chair. Uh, Mr. Yeah, Mr. Chair, just I, I have to interject because, and you know, I think the language and Commissioner Gilbert, I understand, I, I appreciate and I've heard your comments publicly about this, but characterizing my comments in my memo as misleading, I think is, is, uh, is inappropriate because they're not misleading. I was reporting what RTG gave to us in writing in terms of when their trains could be in service. And then I commented on our assessment of whether that was realistic or not, based on the things that we thought we had to do. And as Mr. Guerrero said, if these things happen before November 1st, yes, if everything went perfect, trains could run November 1st. My reporting and my memo was about what did they tell us and what was our assessment of that? So I was not misleading anybody. I want to assure you and the Transit Commission of that. It's not about misleading. It's about being open and transparent about what we received from RTG. No, I appreciate that, Mr. Kanalakos, and, and I thank you. I appreciate that you've pointed that out. I'm not trying to, to imply, and if I did, I apologize and walk that back, Mr. Kanalakos, that you were misleading. What I'm saying is, is that perhaps the information that was provided to you was provided in such a way that was interpreted. You know what I mean? Like, we're not well, saying that trains are gonna be on the tracks on the first, which is what the, which is what the memo said, which is obviously what RTG told you. And now they're saying something completely different. It's a little frustrating. I mean, I'm sure you can, you can appreciate my frustration on this. No, no, I, I, I do. And um, I also recognize that, yeah, our, our track record with respect to dates has not been stellar over the last two years. And people have, not, have acknowledged that. And I think that from a perspective of, you know, what can the public expect? I think we want it to be more realistic about, you know, um, yeah, if everything went perfect, but not everything goes perfect. And so what was the window of time we thought was a more appropriate thing to say from our perspective? Uh, to support RTG, what's the window of time that we could get some service back in? And we thought the first two weeks of November seemed reasonable in the event something happened along the way. But uh, Mr. Guerrero, as he says, you know, it could be November 1st. I mean, that no one has said it can't be, but um, uh, I don't, I don't want to land on, on, on a date and say, oh, everybody get ready, change all your travel plans, your lifestyle, everything, and you're going to be back on the train on November 1st. I didn't want to create that impression of the public because I think that would have been worse. No, and I, I can appreciate that. I'll move on. Um, so this is again for RTG. 
So you've repeatedly stated throughout this meeting that you need to add more monitoring systems and, and, and equipment or whatever to ensure the train's long-term safety, but that you intend to relaunch the train without these systems. You know, you have a, you have a plan for the short term. You have a plan to relaunch the train without these systems, and you're going to mitigate the risk of, of the lack of these systems through increased inspection regimes. So with all due respect, we've heard this before. So after the catenary systems arced, after the wheels developed flat spots, the derailment in August and others, we were told time and time again that inspections and maintenance were going to be increased to mitigate against, mitigate against this risk. So how can we trust, and that is the key word in all of this, that the increased inspection regime, regime that you are proposing is actually going to mitigate the risk that you clearly acknowledge is best mitigated with additional equipment when we go to relaunch this train and put passengers on it again. Okay, there's a lot there. I'm gonna do my best to try and answer it. Please, if I don't, please feel free to follow up. Um, so, I mean, the, the, I didn't wanna insinuate that any short-term mitigation that we're putting together is in any way inadequate. Uh, it's not and will not be. Um, I, that what, I, what I think what I tried to say in the, Perhaps I didn't. I wasn't clear in the way I stated. It, is that we will put short-term mitigation processes in place, such as additional inspections, but at the same time, uh, with a view to put a plans in place that can be sustained over the the, the life of of, of, the, of the of our contract over the, the concession period. That's the plan, and these obviously will be um, vetted through the TRA in the city to ensure that they are comfortable with what we're doing. Um, in terms of mitigation plans, I think it's been alluded to earlier. It's quite common in the industry when an incident happens, whether that be, you know, what we've experienced here through workmanship or, or some sort of failure of a component. Uh, it's not unheard of to put short-term mitigation processes in place, which we've had on, on multiple occasions, most recently with the axle bearing. It's not uncommon to put those in place and ensure that they are robust enough to, to, to mitigate the, the, the risk. And at the same time, parallel to that, work on more long-term uh, fixes through some sort of retrofit program um, above and beyond what the, uh, what the uh, inspection process is. I hope I answered your questions. You did and you didn't, but I appreciate that my question was long-winded. It's just how I am. So here's my point. I'm just gonna be blunt. Councilor Tierney started with the bluntness and I'm just gonna continue it. I don't trust RTG. I don't trust RTG and many people in the city don't trust RTG to do what you say you are going to do. I don't trust that you have the expertise, that you know what you're doing. I don't trust that you are actually going to increase any sort of inspections. And I think you could agree with me that I'm a little hesitant in that trust because again, as I mentioned, after all of the various instances that we've had, aside from derailments, everything else, the response from RTG always was, we're going to inspect. We're going to increase our inspections. We're going. We've got a new maintenance regi regime. We've heard this story before, but now it's a serious safety issue. We've had two derailments. This last derailment was frightening, and I'm just going to put it out there. I don't trust, and many in this city do not trust that RTG is going to do what they say they're going to do. So, how can you prove? to our ridership that you are going to do what you say you're going to do when you've said it before and yet we had another we had another derailment. Only five seconds left. Uh, I mean, what I can tell you, um, I mean, I appreciate the comments and, and, and the sentiments uh, with regards to trust. Uh, I can tell you that our organizations, and I, I speak for the, the uh, our, our partners as well as our subcontractors are 100% committed to, uh, to providing the citizens of Ottawa with, uh, with a safe and reliable service. And, um, you know, and we're doing everything in our power to, to make that happen. Uh, and I understand that trust is only gonna come back when we are able to deliver safe, reliable service in a consistent manner. I get that, I understand that. And that is our goal. And I can tell you that no cost will be spared, that we're 100% committed to making sure that that happens. Uh, and we will work with TRA in the city uh, to make sure that that happens. We're 100% committed to that. I know at this point that might not be enough, but that's all I can promise you at this point is that we're going to do, we are 100% committed to making it happen. Yeah, I've heard that before too. One last question. So when the train derailed, uh, sorry, when the train left Trombley Station, and I'm speaking about the September derailment, in a, it, it left Trombley Station in a derailed state. 
The only reason the train stopped where it did is because it hit a switch and communication was lost. So if it hadn't hit that switch, it would have continued on in a derailed state for God knows how long, maybe into Saint station. So here's my question. How is it that there's no sensor on the train to tell the train itself since it's so smart? And I understand it was in um, automatic mode, meaning the train was essentially driving itself. How is there no sensor to tell the train, oops, you've derailed. Perhaps now is a good time to stop and to initiate an emergency brake. Yeah, I think I, I, I may have answered that before, but... Um... You know, it is true that the, the vehicle only went into emergency brake when it hit the switch. So currently we are looking at the download from the vehicle to see what, what other indications may have been in place. Uh, there, there are um, safety mechanisms to protect uh, when, for example, if the two axles aren't spinning at the same speed, the vehicle will indicate in this particular case, uh, because it was a power bogey, the axles probably were spinning at the same speed. So I think one of our challenges going forward is uh, how do we ensure that we get some sort of indication that, um, you know, some earlier indication that something is wrong that we need. And that, I think that's, that's a wholesome discussion. As I indicated, that's maybe operator training. It, it may be involved, uh, it, it involves looking at the downloads and see if there's anything there. It's a much wholesome discussion. I don't know if the train would have kept going. I can't speculate on that. It's possible, but, uh, but I can tell you it's definitely something that we're looking at to see if there's any more features that we can have to prevent it from happening. Yeah, thank Happy you, Mr. Guerrero. Your time's up, uh, Commissioner, if you're I okay. just wanted to welcome, yeah, I just wanted to welcome Madame Amilcar. Bienvenue à toi. I'm sorry, I okay. forgot to say it before. I just had a lot of questions. So bienvenue, Madame right. Amilcar. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, next up is Councillor McKenna. Uh, McKenney, sorry. And then Councillor Kavanaugh, are you back on the board or is this a hand issue? Don't stir up my time until I start talking. Sure. Yeah, no, we won't start your time. I just want to see if... Okay, she's done. Okay, go ahead, uh, Councillor McKenna. Thank you, uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I'm going to make an understatement here. Uh, I am displeased by everything I've heard today. Everything. Um, I look back at. And I'm going to pick up where I left off. I look back at RTG's plan, and it's eight points here, eight bullets, and except for two, which are about this derailment, the other six undertake an intensive fleet inspection implement a quality assurance, quality governance process, introduction of additional quality control checks, increased oversight, increased vehicle inspections, confirmation that staff are properly trained to perform the additional task, confirmation that all elements of the plan are supported with appropriate documentation, safety and quality reports, confirmation that trains, tracks and rail systems, including the computer-based control system have been tested on and on and on. The fact that that is on a plan today, after two years of what we've been through, after two derailments and a, a rail line that's been shut down for a month. Again, I don't know what to say. This all needed to have been done previously. You know, and I agree with Mr. Kanalakis, we cannot simply characterize this all as a mistake but it's why we need a judicial inquiry into what went wrong here. And if after today, council doesn't agree with what we heard, which was nothing, no assurances that anything is different, that we don't need a judicial inquiry, I don't know what it's gonna take. They own the system, they built it. They designed it and they built it and they cannot maintain it. They don't know the root cause of the August 8th derailment, nor of the September 19th. Why weren't bolts properly put in place? Why did they come loose? It's, it's it, it, you know, it just goes on and on. And then when we talk about, you know, reliability on our system, for staff to sit here and tell us that we, we had 97 to 99% of planned service reliability, I think the word there, the operative word there is planned. This was at a time when we allowed RTG to take a number of uh, trains off the system. The system, it was already reduced. So, you know, they gave us 97% of reduced system. So it's, you know, again, 
understatement to say that I'm displeased. Um, and I hope that people share my, um, you know, my, my concern, it, more than concern. I don't think that this is anywhere near being fixed. And we're going to see it again. We're going to see it between now and, and in a year from now. I want to, I want to leave that aside. I want to talk about buses. And I want to talk about um, the fact that people in this city, and we heard from a couple, but we get messages every day, people uh, out in our system cannot re rely on our transit system. They're buying vehicles, our roads are congested. I mean, it, you know, if you miss one bus, you could wait 40 minutes for another. Our transit system was bad before, but now it is beyond broken. And so I want to go back to the, the number of buses we have and, and the, the capacity we have for, for moving people outside even of the R1. Um, you know, if I understand correctly, uh, Mr. Scrimger, R1 at peak, we have what, 40, approximately 44 buses. Is that, is that correct? One minute left. It's in that range. I think it might be a little higher when you count everything, but it's it's forty. It's above forty. I, I don't know the exact number. And and what is the what is the normal number like? What of of spare buses? Like how many spare buses should we have, and how many do we have? So that when they break down, we can send out uh, a spare. Where we where are we on that? There's different types we have. We hope we have spare buses that we keep in the garage. So if a bus has a problem in the garage or a, a bus that's uh, on some scheduled maintenance, we've got a replacement for it. Then there's buses with operators on them that we put out and station at key spots all across the city so that they can fill in if there's a gap. And then a third group is that we have spare operators who are standing by in the uh, in the garage. Uh, at the at the dispatch office, ready to grab a bus and head out if there's a problem. And the numbers of all of those are different by time of day. Uh, but I the the uh, point I was hoping to make earlier was that all of these are are now stretched to their maximum and beyond uh, as these people are devoted to providing the R1 bus service. So our ability to respond to other things that goes on is necessarily uh, constrained by the fact that we have to commit. These buses to the R1 service. Okay. Well, listen, I have an offer to make to the chair and Mr. Kanalakis, to the, our city manager. And it's a big offer. And I'm serious about it. I will personally purchase extra buses for this failing transit system for residents. There is a sale on right now, a actual former OC Transpo articulated buses out of St. Louis. And I'm making this commitment today. They're on sale. There are 11 of them and eight of them are operational. And they're on sale for $100. They won't last, the, the sale won't last long. I think it's up by October 25th. And I am dead serious. I will pay the $100. Given the situation that we're in, we need to improve our service immediately and we need these buses for the next time the LRT is down. So I've got my credit card ready to go. I can send you the ad. It is in, um, I'll send it over now. Uh, it is in a public surplus um, ad and it is 11 buses for $100. And we can get those here and we can have them and they're articulated. And we can have eight buses that can go through Council Fleury's ward as you heard, those are low income residents who are being left out and they can go through our communities to ensure that the people who are clerks in grocery stores, frontline workers, people going, into, going to uh, work in hospitals, people who have no other way of getting around the city, at least we'll have eight articulated buses. That's time. That's my well, Thank you, Councillor McGinney, for your generous offer and uh, on more interested in this ad that you found, uh, uh, maybe an option that we can look at. Uh, Mr. Charter, would that uh, fall to you to uh, investigate and see the condition of these buses, et cetera? 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. That's something that our staff can investigate and look at um, and consider what the timeline would be and what would be required to uh, put them back into service should they be in a stated condition that they could, like, as advertised. That is something that we could investigate. Okay, I will send well, it over and my, and my offer us. stands to pay for them. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor McGinney. Uh, next up is Councillor King. Uh, thank you, Chair. And uh, I'd like to uh, closely associate, uh, 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 I guess, uh, my comments uh, uh, of, of uh, welcome uh, to uh, Ms. Amakar. I, I really am looking forward to having a conversation with you uh, about um, transit in the city. And I know all my colleagues are as well. They're excited that you're here. Um, I also wanted to uh, closely associate my, some of my comments with uh, those of Councillor uh, McKinney, who is uh, seeking uh, more sunshine in processes. And I think I would agree that that would require uh, an independent uh, judicial um, um, investigation. I think that uh, there are many questions that need to be asked. Um, I also uh, would uh, associate uh, myself uh, with uh, Councillor Gower and uh, some of his uh, requests around a return to service plan being submitted. Um, you know, if it's a confidential uh, a document, ensuring that that's made public so that we know how to go forward. Uh, but the questions that I have uh, really revolve around uh, some of the uh, questions of, of my colleagues uh, thinking of um, of uh, of uh, Commissioner Wright to Gilbert and as well as uh, Councillor uh, Weeper who are asking questions about um, the technology, about uh, re-engineering and retrofitting on a long-term scale. And uh, what I wanted to ask is um, in the last transit commission meeting, we heard that uh, some of the technologies, whether they were hot box technologies or sensor technologies uh, were more apt to be implemented on um, heavy rail systems. If we're looking at re-engineering and retrofitting, will we be looking at uh, the application of these heavy rail type of technologies in uh, our light rail system? Or at least will we be asking Alstrom to, to do that? So I, I, can, I can take that uh, chair if... Uh... If that works, uh, so I've I've been in a lot of conversations with Alstom as to what this technology looks like. As as you may know, I do interface with the Transportation Safety Board, so I do know where this is going. And then to your point about it being a heavy rail technology, that is that is correct. So Alstom, being the vehicle and design manufacturer, they are best suited to understand what would be the best early onset technology to uh, be a precursor and prevent derailments from happening of this nature. So um, <clears throat> Alstom is looking into it and they've, uh, as I think my colleague said earlier, they've identified other means as well that could uh, <clears throat> could be used to detect it more so than heat because there is a concern about um, the threshold of heat being a detector and it could be too late at that point. So rest assured they are doing a very full and comprehensive analysis of what the best technology is for the Confederation line to prevent these types of incidents from happening, but we have to go through that due diligence process to make sure we have the best technology for that. Does that answer your question? I think it does. Um, I have a supplementary set of questions. Um, are the vehicles that we are using that are being manufactured by Alstrom, are these uh, the uh, same vehicles and the same supplier uh, for the Finch Avenue uh, LRT line. I'll defer that to Mr. Guerra. Uh, for the most part, yes, they are. So, so my supplementary question uh, there is, uh, are we talking with Metrolinx? Um, because obviously uh, they're manufacturing trains uh, for uh, that LRT line in a different municipality in Toronto. Um, are they learning lessons? I mean, I, I'm just wondering, are we in sync here? Um, as they're manufacturing these trains, they're not working in Ottawa. So are we talking uh, with Metrolinx to, to ensure that if they are taking corrective steps or actions, I'm assuming they're, they're, they're turning on their TVs or, or uh, you know, reading the star in Toronto and learning about our problems. I'm just curious if we are, are leveraging that and are attempting to learn uh, you know, from the, their experience with their new manufacturing processes. I'll, I'll defer to the city uh, on whether Metrolinx yeah. has been in touch or not. 
Mr. Uh, Mr. Chair, through you to the councilor, we have been uh, obviously engaged with uh, Metrolinx on a uh, on some discussions in the past. You know, I think that the the fixes and the changes to the vehicles uh, that we've made in our system are very public. You know, there's no there's no uh, question that, for example, the changes to the the lid of the junction case for the inductors is a very positive change, and and they would benefit from that. The the vehicles for the uh, Finch line are being manufactured at the Brampton facility, which is where the additional stage two vehicles are being manufactured. So they're coming out of the same facility. And so there is obviously some lessons learned there. And we've got a resident inspector on the shop floor looking at their processes there. I believe Metrolinx also has a resident inspector on the shop floor. And so we are, there's lots of eyes on those vehicles to make sure that uh, the lessons learned in Ottawa are applied to the Finch vehicle. The Finch vehicle is a bit different. You know, it's a different voltage. You know, we don't have all the, we're not privy to all the technical details. It is a slightly different vehicle, so it's not exactly the same, but anything that they've learned about, uh, you know, the auxiliary power units to the inductor lids, to the, uh, to the operation of the pantograph, you know, I, I'm, I'm positive all those things are being applied to the Finch project and they're, they're watching what we're doing in Ottawa very closely. Well, I just hope that there is a closer a correlation between uh, what uh, uh, other uh, transit authorities are doing and what we're doing to to really help uh, sort out the the problems, especially around re-engineering and, and and retrofit retrofitting. If we are going to do that on a long term basis uh, with these trains, we have to get it right. And uh, not unlike uh, what um, Commissioner Wright Gilbert was saying, uh, we should have real time information. We should have the proper types of sensors to deal and to, to, to really lead towards resolution of the challenges that we have been seeing uh, with our transit system. So I thank you for uh, those answers. I think I'll leave it there. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor. I, I just want to give everybody an update on uh, Councillor McKinney's uh, ad. It's not an ad, it's an auction, and uh, there's five days left in the auction, so let's not count on those buses just yet. And um, it, the price right now is up to $1,500, so it, it's going, but it's a, it's a great option, so I hope, uh, Mr. Charter, you're able to investigate these buses in Missouri and see if uh, we can get them, because um, I think all of the commission's in agreement. We've got to look at having a few more buses in the system. Okay, Councillor Leeper, go ahead when you're ready. Thank you very much, uh, Catherine. I'll pitch in. Um, so only one, uh, one, uh, one final question was, uh, Kerry mentioned early at the top during delegations, the potential for road closures to help speed the buses along. Uh, you know, there are a number of bottlenecks across the city. Uh, I'm most familiar with the ones that are at like Lion and Queen, Rideau Street, um, the other day we were uh, absolutely driven nuts on a packed R1 uh, with a, a garbage truck uh, running down uh, Rideau Street, uh, holding us up for probably a good 10 minutes while uh, multiple people on the bus were standing. Have we looked at the potential to close roads to regular vehicular traffic in an effort to solve some of those bottlenecks? Uh, Mr. Chair, yes, we have. We've talked, uh, we've been talking and continue to talk with our colleagues in traffic services um, about what possibilities there are. Uh, and the way the, the discussion goes is, um, can we, first of all, if we close either Rito or Queen to, uh, to auto traffic, does the, uh, the backup of cars on other streets then delay the R1 buses or any other OC transport buses um, uh, at those other locations, and the second is, what are the uh, what are the operational things that have to continue to occur on those streets, even if the road is closed? So, for instance, uh, when we've been talking about Queen Street, we've been talking about the the need to provide access in and out of um, parking garages and uh, other driveways for uh, property owners whose only access point is on Queen. But we're continuing to have those discussions, and uh, you know, based on um, the comments we've heard here today, I, I understand that from some of the councillors, there might very well be support for that, and we'll be talking about it further. I'll be talking with Bill later on. Where are you seeing those bottlenecks today? 
I, I wouldn't say that we're seeing bottlenecks. What we're seeing is that there's, uh, you know, the, the, the traditional points of, of congestion. Uh, the bus has to come up King Edward, the bus has to get across Laurier, the bus has to get down Waller Street. All of those intersections are, are busy at times. Uh, and the bus has to get across Queen, which means getting through the intersection of Queen and Bank. Um, these are the normal places. Uh, on the other hand, we've got, you know, pretty unconstrained operations at almost everywhere east of Herdman. And we've still got the reserve bus lanes in place west of uh, Pimacy, uh, which keep the buses moving well. Um, so we'll just, uh, you know, part of it is if we just tweak the, the traffic signals a little, we can give more priority to the through, uh, through buses, which delays the uh, buses and, and cars on the cross street. And, and it's an ongoing thing, but we will look again and more deeply at the possibility of um, closing those, those streets. I don't think that's, I don't, myself, I don't think it's a reasonable prospect for us to close King Edward. Um, there, I don't think it's a possibility for us to close Queen completely, but there might be some possibilities to restrict uh, what cars are, what cars and trucks are authorized at uh, to turn different directions on that street. I don't don't know for sure. We'll continue to talk about it with traffic. I mean, we've heard the stories from the riders and and both the delegations this morning uh, made clear just what kind of an impact this is having on folks who are probably some of our most vulnerable residents, right? Uh, with the least choice available to them uh, to get around the town. And uh, do you have a timeline for when you might be able to make some of these kinds of decisions, say yes or no to uh, vehicle restrictions in order to speed our buses? Because it doesn't sound like our buses or our train is coming back in the next several weeks anyways, if not longer. So we've, we've been talking about this since the very beginning. We were talking about it on, on September 20th. We've been talking about it continuously since. Um, if there's a, a change today, it's the added support from people who've spoken today uh, that, um, that may indicate that there's more of a public acceptance of putting some restrictions on mobility for people who aren't using transit. Yeah, I mean, some of those most important buses uh, Rideau is a particular concern of mine, given the number of heavily used local buses, in addition now to the R1, uh, and the time it's taking to get through that corridor is um, uh, uncomfortable at, uh, at peak. So I'd, I'd urge you to give serious consideration to creating some, uh, some bus-only roads to help uh, speed people around the city. That's it. Thanks, uh, thanks, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Leeper. Uh, Councillor Deans, please. Thanks, uh, Mr. Chair. Is Mr. Kanalaka still on the call? Because I wanted to ask him. Yes, okay. <laughs> just, hiding, just hiding behind the screen there. That's okay. Um, Mr. Kanalaka, I think we've all heard enough today to know realistically that uh, the partial service is not coming back on November 1st. I mean, it's highly unlikely. In fact, what you said earlier is even the partial service a lot of things would have to go right for even partial service to be restored by mid-November. So if it were restored by mid-November, which a lot of things have to go right to make that happen, when would you expect full service to be restored? Yeah, to qualify that, what I actually said was that a lot of things have to go right for it to be restored November 1st partial service, but that we're, we're feeling much better about a bin November partial service. Um, and we're supposed to get something from RTG and you might wanna pose that counselor to, uh, to our RTG RTM representatives. By the end of the week, uh, they have committed to give us a full service return plan and we haven't received that yet. So I'm not going to speculate. Okay, so maybe the representatives from RTG or RTM could tell us when you're speculating at this point a full return to service. Um, yeah, I can take that. We are, as, as Mr. Tenalakis indicated, we are in a process of working with our subcontractor to provide a date for um, for full return to service. I unfortunately don't have that for you at this point yet. Okay, so Mr. Tenalakis, back to you then, because I'm thinking about uh, the promise that's been made to transit customers about free December transit service, and it sounds chaotic to me at this point, uh, that 
We may have seven trains up and running by middle of November. Right now, we don't even have a date for the resumption of full service. And honestly, I don't really believe our TG's dates anyway. So I'm looking for you for more realistic dates. Um, but, you know, Councillor Gower has a motion that he's putting about extending the, the time. I was thinking when he first um, mentioned that, that, well, if we're going to free service in December, we we probably don't need that. But I just don't see how we get to free service in, in December without creating more chaos than we already have in this city with our transit system, because if we have free service, presumably that will attract more people to the transit system. And we don't seem to have any capacity, even if Councillor McKenna comes through with their 11 buses. So, so when are you going to tell us that maybe we should back off that promise and look to a different date? I recall, Councillor, um, the discussion that happened at, um, I think it was at Council last time. I'm trying to remember, we've had so many meetings, but um, the last time we discussed this publicly, I think there were two um, important points. One, I believe the motion that was moved uh, said that the service would have to be up and running, the train service would have to be running before we go to free service, and that we would need uh, several weeks in advance before we could actually go to free service, so that uh, I would expect that by, you know, first of all, Two things that two more things have to happen. We need to receive the return to service of the full fleet projection and assess that from our TG, and hopefully we'll get that by the end of this week. I'm hoping, and um, if we get that, then that assessment I think will drive um, what position we're going to be in to be able to return to a level of service where we're comfortable to offer free service and deal with the capacity issues. Knowing that December is normally a bit of a, um, a lower month anyways, just from students and everything else, it's not one of our peak months. So, but, uh, so the key decision point I think will be our assessment of RTG's return to service and whether then there's enough time to be actually implement it. Otherwise um, we'll be in a position we'll have to come back uh, to council with a reconsideration or a, a, a revised recommendation. So would you be in a position by council next week to make a recommendation? I mean, I just heard you say you would need several weeks advance notice. Next week will be pretty much the end of October. Um, would you be in a position to let us know so we could give our transit customers a little advance notice? Well, I can't say it's going to be next week. Um, I can't make that commitment, council, because, um, you know, obviously we want to... The full return to service plan will take some work by TRA and our staff to review to say, okay, is this reasonable and can it be done? So I don't want to make a commitment, but if, when we know, we will tell you. I mean, just like we did with um, uh, with the first notice we received on Friday, as soon as we, you know, we worked all weekend, everybody was in all weekend working at it, looking at the 140 page document. And as soon as we knew on Monday morning after we regrouped to say, can we accept this date and what does it mean? I put the memo out and I'm making that commitment too for the next stage. Okay, but there will be several weeks advance notice. I think we're gonna have to have several weeks advance notice so that we can't just leave people, you know, hanging out there in terms of the, 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 the decision. Okay, thank you. Those are one of my questions. Thank you, Councillor Deans. Uh, next up, Commissioner Caracalla. I haven't heard yet um, a commitment to address the thermal monitoring from anybody yet and whether or not that'll be a condition to uh, launch, relaunch back to service. Can somebody speak to that, please? Sure, I can, I can speak to it. Like I said previously, there's got to be a very thorough assessment as to if it is thermal uh, or if it's something else that could perhaps be more effective for this system and technology. So that analysis should encompass what that is. Um, to be able to go through changes in infrastructure equipment, we have to go through a risk, uh, risk analysis process where we determine how we're reducing the risk and to what level we've reduced it to. So this whole analysis and assessment will bring us to the point where we have reduced risk to the lowest possible uh, way possible through this technology, whether it be through acoustic monitoring, picking up vibrations of metal before it excites to a thermal state, or if it is thermal monitoring, in fact. So I appreciate I'm not necessarily giving you an answer as to what the contingent piece is to how we go back to service, but I, I don't have that answer until we've gone through that full analysis of what that is yet. Okay, great. I just don't want to I just want to make sure that we don't lose sight of that, especially given the fact that uh, 
Transport Canada has indicated that that was a, a main cause of the derailment. So hopefully we see that in detail in the plan or the briefing that we get at some point before service relaunches. Absolutely. It's, it, it's at the top of my mind as well, rest assured. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Commissioner. All right, that concludes the questions on this. I think, uh, Councillor Gower, your motion is ready. Councillor Gower. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. wonder if our committee coordinator has it ready to go. So be it resolved that Transit Commission recommend that Council approve that as soon as possible, the maximum transfer time for OC Transpo conventional bus service to be extended by 30 minutes until such time that the General Manager of Transit Services is of the opinion that R1 bus replacement service, which commenced in September 2021, is no longer required. And be it further resolved that staff update council and members of the Transit Commission confirming the timing for implementation of the extension. So I did, uh, I did ask Mr. Scrimshaw and, and his staff to assist with the wording so that this was something that they could implement. And uh, that, that second, there, therefore, be it resolved, addresses that there is some uncertainty about how long this would take to implement. Mr. Scrimshaw has indicated approximately one month. I would hope that we can do that sooner, but uh, he will let our commission and council know a more accurate timeline. Uh, did you want to add anything to that, uh, Pat, or are you good with that? No, if this motion passes, we can follow these uh, directions. Perfect. Thank you. Is this motion carried? Oh, sorry. I have a question. Oh, oh sorry. I, actually, I, I, I have a... Councilor McKinney, my apologies. Sorry, yeah. I actually have an amendment. I'd like to amend it so that it reads that the uh, uh, it be extended by 60 minutes. I think that 30 is not... Uh, sufficient for people traveling on the system. We heard today that people are running late by 35, 40, 50 minutes often. So I'd just like to uh, make that amendment um, for, to uh, read 60 minutes. I don't know if that's friendly or if we have to vote on that first. Councilor Gower. Uh, I hadn't considered it. Um, I think I'd consider that a friendly amendment. Councilor McKenna, yes. Okay. And Mr. Scrimger, it doesn't create any new problems for you? It would be the same operational work. Okay. Okay. Uh, so um, I guess we have, uh, do you have any other questions, uh, Councilor McKinney, or we'll go to Councilor uh, Kluge? No, I'm, I'm good. Thank you. And good. thank you, uh, Councilor Gower. Okay. Uh, thank you. Councilor Kluge. Thank you, Chair. Um, at the risk of a procedural quagmire, another friendly amendment or perhaps another motion, and I'll, I'll let the mover and uh, the mover of the friendly amendment consider. I am wondering if my objective would be to move on a permanent basis to a two hour or 120 minute transfer period. My suggestion is that we do it by January, uh, given that operationally we're almost in November and tentatively December would be a free transit month. And there is software being uploaded in January because there is fair changes. And that a, a, a city close by, the city of Toronto has a 120 minute transfer window. My Question to staff is, do we have any idea what that would cost on a permanent basis to move to a 120 minute transfer window? And depending on that answer, operationally, could that be implemented in January in a uh, comprehensive way when other software is, is um, the database that you referred to earlier, Pat, uh, is implemented? So I'm going from memory here. Um, I believe that question was asked and we provided a response um, in around early 2019, which estimated that, uh, that doing such a thing, and I'm not sure it was exactly 120 minutes, but I, I, my, my memory is that it was, um, would have a, an annual operating or lost revenue uh, of approximately $900,000 a year at full ridership. Uh, um, so that would have been 
2019 dollars and that would have been 2019 ridership so it would be a little it would be you know same ballpark uh, once we get back to full ridership and that's that uh, revenue loss comes from the balance of uh, people making more trips but um, not but some people make continuing to make the same trips they do now, but being to go, you know, back home within that same window. The other thing I'd uh, ask that uh, if you're um, proposing this, that you consider is that uh, there would be a bit of a conflict between 120 minutes and the other motion, which would result in temporarily longer uh, longer transfer windows than 120 minutes. The 105 plus 60 would be 165 minutes. The uh, the 90 plus 60 would be uh, 150 uh, minutes or two hours and 30 minutes. Yeah. Minutes. Oh. Um, and maybe uh, if I could, but, uh, but that operationally. Now the other possibility is maybe that that could be a budget question rather than a, a remedial question at this stage. Right. So, Councillor Cloutier, this motion, uh, Councillor Gower's motion has to rise to council. So I wonder if instead of if we pile on more amendments to this, if we just either carry the motion now and then work with Councillor Gower to make any more changes before we deal with it at council, or would everybody rather just defer the motion to council and um, without voting on it here, but uh, contact Councillor Gower to make any changes that they'd like. Would that be acceptable? But with my friendly amendment, right, has already been accepted. Your friendly amendment, everybody's agreed to here, Councillor okay. McKinney, but uh, you know, we've got, uh, Councillor Cluche wants to add things to it that we're hearing could cost a million dollars. Uh, Commissioner Caracato is up here. He may want to add something. I'm just uh, trying to bring some order to it. So either uh, I'm looking for direction from the commission if you'd like to vote on Councillor Gower's motion with, with McKinney's amendment on it now, or would you rather just defer the whole thing to uh, council and then work with Councillor Gower on changes in, in between? Chair, I, I'll, I'll, I, I don't want to, uh, I, I want to simplify. I am happy to vote on Councillor Gower's motion as amended by uh, Commissioner McKinney. Uh, Councillor McKenney, Commissioner McKenney. Okay. Um, Thank yeah. you. Yeah, um, I see. But, but but I I will say to Councillor Gower, Councillor Gower, I would like to uh, connect with you and, and perhaps Commissioner uh, Councillor McKenney, so that we could talk about whether we want to further adjust or explore because of the operational costs of doing a temporary uh, database change and perhaps having to revert later back to an hour and a half versus. For service for our residents. Okay, Councillor Cloutier, can, can we just so pause there, please? Can we just pause, Councillor Cloutier? Okay. Glenn, did you did you want to wrap up or you want to hold your motion and we'll deal with it later? Well, well, what would you like to all, I think Vice Chair Cloutier is on the right track here. Um, what I wanted to ask procedurally is, is if indeed this is rising to council, because time is of the essence. Does it have to go to council or can we just make that decision as a commission directly looking for advice perhaps from clerk or yeah, that'll have come from the clerk's office um caitlin are you on there did you want to weigh in on that yes mr chair in consultation with the city clerk uh due to the financial implications we have given the advice that it should rise to council however i believe staff uh would be in a position to begin the preliminary preparations based on uh commission's decision today in order to be set up to implement that. Okay, that is good. Thank you, Chair. That's good. And does that work for you, Councillor Kluge? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Uh, okay, so, and I understand from Mr. Scrimger that uh, we may be able to work some of these details out uh, as part of the fair working group that Councillor McKenney and I and Commissioner Caracato are on. So we have an opportunity there too to, to work with this. Okay. So we're all good. Thank you. So I Mr. also, Chair? yeah, sorry, Councilor Deans, go I, ahead. I received a uh, question from the public that I was wondering if I could just ask before we wrap up on this whole topic. Okay. Um, it's, um, it's basically about the partial return to service. And what they're saying is that uh, when it partially returns the, um, 
gap between trains would probably be eight to 10 minutes. And they were asking if it would be possible to uncouple those trains and run uh, single vehicles as opposed to double vehicles in order to have more frequency of the train. So four to five minute service instead of eight to 10 minute service. Uh, Michael, did you want to take that? Or Troy, either one? Right. Yeah. Right. Mr. Chair, I, I can answer the question. I mean, oh, thank you. Uh, uh, you know, uh, it, it is technically possible to, to be able to uncouple the trains. Um, it's something that we wouldn't necessarily recommend at this time. It, it would change the, uh, the loading patterns and, and what customers have been used to for the, the past two years on the rail line. Um, but as well, um, it would introduce a, a, a new um, a process for RTG to manage at this point, coupling and uncoupling trains. Um, so it, it is possible. It's just It just adds another uh, variable to the equation of our return to service plan right now. So um, for, from the customer loading perspective and from the introducing a new variable, it's not, not, not necessarily something we'd recommend at this time, but um, to answer your question, yes, it, it is possible that uh, the trains could be uncoupled and, and run run a single car single car train. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Chair. Mr. Mr. Chair, if I, if I could add one more thing, it would sure. also introduce a new condition for uh, customers with disabilities, in particular customers with visual disabilities who've been used to boarding the train from all points along the platform. Mm -hmm. uh, they would now have a, a new hazard that uh, as the train arrived, they would have the uh, th there would be the, the hazard that they could step into the trackway rather than onto the train. And so it would require us to uh, go through a proper analysis and information session for uh, for customers with those particular disabilities. Troy, could you, um, if Steve, could you uh, just state what the frequency of the trains would be if we had seven on there? What would be the frequency? Because I, I missed that. Uh, with, uh, with with seven trains operating the entire length of the line, you're looking at about a, a seven and a half minute service frequency at that. Councillor Dean, so is that uh, sufficient? Yeah, that's all for me. Just wanted to ask that question. Great, okay, thank you. Uh, okay, so I also want to thank uh, uh, um, our new general manager for joining us today, Renee. Great to... Uh, have you participate with us today. Uh, I wanna thank RTG and RTM for coming back out to our meeting this month. Um, Mario, uh, uh, thank you for your uh, attempt to answer as many questions as possible here for us. It's, it is appreciated. And uh, to TRA, I wanna welcome you all here. I, I think it's, um, I get the sense from uh, the questions that uh, the commissioners asked that uh, you're uh, a welcome uh, co contributor to this discussion. And uh, I certainly think you're going to give us a little more confidence in the system by having uh, you participate as a set of extra eyes on, on this whole situation for us. So welcome and thank you for spending the day with us. Okay, so uh, that concludes the update. Folks, we'll now move on to our last item, which is the OC Transpo Performance Report for the period ending June 2021. 20, um, uh, we have a presentation with slides from Mr. Scrimger. Uh, we also have a delegation on this, and then we'll go to questions to staff. Well, Mr. Scrimger is getting ready. I want to thank the subcommittee that worked on the, these performance um, reviews, uh, report, sorry. Uh, and that was uh, Mr. Scrimger, Councillor Gower, Councillor Suds, who's no longer with us. But also, I think we should uh, acknowledge the contribution of Councillor Brockington, who also contributed a lot into uh, what we could measure or should be measuring. So uh, on that note, Pat, whenever you're ready uh, to start with your presentation, it'd be appreciated. Chair, uh, before moving on, if I may, and I may have missed this as well, but uh, would it be possible to confirm if the uh, Gower motion is uh, carried? Oh, <laughs> thank you. The uh, commission uh, was the Gower motion amended by McKenney uh, carried. 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 Okay. Thank you. Okay, so um, uh, uh, Mr. Scrimger, if you'd like to start, and uh, Vice Chair Kluche, could I get you to take over the chair, please? Absolutely, Chair. Yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Eric, uh, when you have the slides ready, uh, let me know.
Good. Thank you very much. So before we move on, I'll just uh, remind you that uh, we're we're following the same uh, the, the process that you, that you approved uh, the selection of measures that you approved several months ago, and this is our second report on this. And what we're reporting on here is the performance for the twelve months between July 2020 and June 2021. So now we're seeing a a window that completely covers a pandemic influenced 12 month period and does not include some of the most recent things that have happened at OC Transpo or in the uh, or in the broader economy. Uh, thanks. So if we can have the next slide, please. So uh, restating these things, the, the performance measures were approved by the Transit Commission at, on February 17th. Uh, we've been directed to report to you on this twice annually. This is our second report. Uh, this is also the first one that includes two measures that, uh, that you adopted in, in April, um, expanding the information that we provide to you on customer safety through uh, customer injury rate and a crime rate. And so, as I said, this reports on the performance during the 12 month period from July, 2020. So the first day of July, July 1st, 2020, to the last day of June, 2021. Next slide, please. And here is uh, just a, an overview of the measures that uh, we collect and collate and analyze, and that I'll show you the key information on today. There's much more detail in the report, uh, which you may have read or may be uh, going to read later on. Next slide, please. So we'll start with customer safety measures. Uh, the first is the severe customer injury rate. These are customers, these are injuries which are at level three, four, or five on the, our five scale level of severity. And therefore these are injuries that require transport to hospital um, and which resulted, which occurred as a result of transit operations or transit activities. In uh, the calendar year 2020, that was at 0 0.81 per million customer trips. In the year that we're talking about right now, July, 2020 to June, 2021, 1.36 uh, injuries of this type per million trips. Uh, I'd like to caution you that comparability between old numbers and new numbers is because these are rates and ratios, it's not just a result of changes in the top measure, the number of injuries which occurred, it's also a result of changes in the per million trips because we're not carrying as many customers during this year as we did during the, the full calendar year 2020. The next slide, please. Uh, this is this is it. The absolute number of injuries was similar with 33 injuries in the calendar year 2020 compared to 35 in this 12 month period. I'd also like to point out here that uh, many of these are new measures. No, no, no this is just sweet. Oh. Many of these are new measures and uh, we will get into a, a, a better rhythm and being able to compare uh, mid year to mid year 12 month periods in future than we can right now. Um, so we're, we're looking, we're, uh, these comparisons are sort of an overlap of 12 month periods. The next slide, please. Uh, there's a, a, a 12 month rolling average. So we're looking back at the 12 months ending on each of those dates. And you can see that that number crept up um, during the period when ridership declined. Next slide, please. The new measure is the overall customer injury rate. This is not just levels three, four, and five, but levels two, three, four, and five. So this includes also the injuries requiring treatment by paramedics. Uh, so uh, here's the comparison uh, that in 2020, that was at 1.23 per million customer trips. And for the 12 month period now, 1.83 per million customer trips. Uh, 47 in this 12 month period, 50 in the full year of 2020. The next slide, please. That's the, a very similar graph to what you saw earlier, showing that uh, the rate increased because the number of uh, injuries was very similar while the ridership was lower. Next, please. The next new measure is the crime rate. This is the measure, the measure of the crimes against person, crimes against property, other criminal code offenses, and drug-related offenses. And between July 2020 and June 2021, that is six crimes per 100,000 
customer trips. This is approximately 1500 during that period. It's a slight decrease from years past, but the rate again is elevated because ridership has declined during this period. And in future years, you'll be able to see uh, this, these trends or stability uh, as we get build a history on this, uh, this calculation. Next, please. Um, just some comments on there, which you can re read more details of in the report that offenses in the crimes against person have made up a declining share um, at 20% uh, of the offenses overall down from 25%. So the other, uh, the other categories within the crime rate are, um, are taking up a greater share of the total. Next, please. Here's how that breaks down. Uh, in different periods, we've uh, crimes against person, you can see declining from 25 down to 19. Crimes against property, fairly steady there at 21. Other criminal code offenses, very steady at uh, 45, 46%, but drug offenses increasing from 2% up to 6% of the total. Next, please. Uh, the next category after customer safety is ridership, where we report the total link trips. And by link trip, we mean a complete trip from origin to destination that someone would make, regardless of the number of buses and trains they ride to make that trip. Uh, very heavily influenced by the COVID-19 pandemic. And you'll know that this 12 month period, um, of course, reflects some of our months of lowest ridership, uh, which and it excludes the uh, increasing ridership that we've seen since the end of, of June. But uh, in that 12 month period, we carried 24.5 million customers, which is 40% than we did in the calendar year 2020. We did see higher ridership in the months of April, May, and June 2021 than we did in April, May, and June 2020. Uh, in fact, in April, we had 80% more customers than we did a year earlier. But again, all of these numbers very, very heavily influenced by the pandemic. Next, please. And you can see in gray what a pre-pandemic year was. That was 2019 uh, with the train opening there in, in September, October train and the, and the bus route changes in October 2019 in the gray bars. And then you can see in the blue bars that in January and February, we had higher ridership, January, February 2020, higher ridership than we had a year earlier than in March. You see the beginning of the effect of the pandemic uh, because most of those restrictions came into place partway through March. And then you can see the very low ridership that we had in April, May, and June 2020, rising a little bit, those higher blue bars um, in the second half of 2020. Then we had another dip uh, at the right at uh, just after Christmas with the, the second or third wave. And, uh, and uh, then you see a little bit lower. Now, when we report to you, uh, six months from now, you'll see some of the increases that have happened since that point, the end of June. But as you can see again here, because of the pandemic, very difficult to make any year-to-year -year comparisons other than, wow, that's a lot lower. Yes, thanks, Eric. Uh, bus and ridership per capita. So here's a, our opportunity to compare ourselves uh, to other cities in Canada. And we, this represents the number of transit trips per resident per year of the population in the urban transit area. Uh, very low, of course, but you'll see very low across the country. We had 44 trips per capita in 2020, down from 107 in 2019. Um, you, you'll see on the next slide that, uh, that we've had a lot of consistency. All cities have had a lot of consistency and they all consistently went down in 2020. I'll just point out before we move on that this is calculated once per year. We can't do this um, every six months because this is based on uh, calculations that are being reported by transit agencies across the country. Next slide, please. So here you can see Ottawa towards the right, second from the right. If you look at the, the blue and orange bars, you can see how uh, Vancouver had consistent ridership per capita in 2018, 2019. Edmonton, very consistent. Calgary, Toronto, Edmonton, Montreal, all very consistent. And then in 2020, all consistently lower. Um, some lessons we can draw here. You can see that everyone fell to less than half of uh, their normal transit ridership per capita with the, the pandemic influenced year 2020. 
Uh, presumably, it'll be uh, a little bit lower still in 2021 for all of these cities. But you can also see here that in a normal year, a non-pandemic year, Ottawa has higher transit ridership per capita than any city in Canada other than Toronto and Montreal, which have those uh, huge suburban catchment areas and and um, you know much greater downtown development. Uh, but uh, you can also see that in 2020, per capita, we now we've fallen lower than Vancouver and Edmonton, which we would normally be slightly higher than. And uh, one possible explanation for that is. Uh, that Ottawa has such a heavily office-based and university-based economy and travel patterns uh, that we don't have as much, uh, we don't have as many people who still needed to travel to work during the pandemic as those other, other cities did. But you can see across the board, huge ridership losses, not just in absolute numbers, but per capita um, in, in all cities across Canada. Next, please. Now we uh, still in the category of ridership, we'll talk about paratransport ridership, again, very heavily influenced by the pandemic. Um, ridership, just as it was in the conventional services, higher in 2021, April, May, June, than it was in 2020, uh, up more than double in April from what it was in April a year earlier. In the 12 month period, we carried just under 300,000 customer trips on paratransport. Next, please. And here is a similar graph to what you saw earlier. You can see that as we compare 2019 to 2020, we had higher paratransport ridership in January, we had higher paratransport ridership in February, and then uh, March shows the, the uh, decline result of the pandemic, and then April, May, June, very low, and then we get the, the gradual increase, very similar pattern to what we saw, and you can see January because of that, uh, that uh, additional lockdowns that came in around that time, again, being lower than it was in December 2020. And what you will see when we bring this back to you again in six months, is you'll start to see some of the increases that have occurred since, since the end of June 2021. Next, please. Uh, we're now moving on to customer service and customer service contacts. This is uh, some numbers showing uh, the contacts that customers have had with our representatives through all channels. Uh, again, pandemic influenced uh, because fewer people are traveling, fewer people were contacting us for information. Um, telephone calls represent the majority of contacts during this period, 58% uh, of those being related to paratranspo, 19% being people asking about trip cancellations. Uh, again, not comparable year to year uh, because of the pandemic influence. But we'll go to the next slide, please, and you can see a few numbers here. Um, you can see the great, you know, these, this is the same graph you've seen for ridership on the conventional system, ridership on paratranspo. You see that January and February have that decline going into March. And then the, um, they just not as many people need information about transit when they're, when they're not traveling. The next slide, please. Uh, this is the measure on average time to answer inquiries. So for someone who's on the, the phone queue, how long were they on the phone queue before reaching a customer service representative? What you'll see here is that those uh, wait durations got shorter um, because of the reduced number of calls coming in during the pandemic. But there's some, uh, there's a couple of other things we'll show you on this slide coming up. Next slide, please. There we go. And what you can see is in 2019, uh, where the average time to answer was. Uh, been very high before the middle of 2019. You can see that it was lower in the second half of 2019. We had some very long and very unacceptable wait times. But one thing that's very important here that we can show you is pre-pandemic, before we saw the ridership reductions, if you compare the January and February 2019 versus 2020, you can see that those wait times dropped from half an hour or more down to just a few minutes. And that's all a result of the additional investment that council made into uh, customer service staffing levels in the 2020 budget. Those people came in and uh, you know we just had more capacity to, to take those calls. Now, what you can see after March 2020 is the waiting times have been so short to almost be, uh, to almost not show up on the graph. And that's, uh, 
uh, a result of uh, the, the volume of calls coming in being, being so small that, um, that uh, our capacity to answer them is, is almost instant. Um, a great, uh, you know, there's, a, there's been a great continuity by our, our customer service representatives who in March 2020 moved almost seamlessly from working in our call center to working and taking those calls from home. And they've been, uh, they've been excellent and they've been able to continue to provide that service uh, by work, even though they're working at a distance. The next slide, please. Now we're moving to the next category of service availability. This is the percentage of scheduled hours for service that were delivered as, uh, as planned for bus and O-Train. Um, we'll show you uh, some numbers that don't include O-Train line two after it closed for reconstruction. Um, we'll show you that service availability uh, consistently above 97%, apart from uh, one bad month uh, on uh, O-Train line one, which which we've talked about at length in previous uh, previous meetings. What you're seeing here is is the echo of what uh, Troy's briefed you on in previous months, coming back and showing up in the semi-annual review. Um, we also, uh, as as we talked about at the time, had some bus operator shortages in July and August a year ago, 2020, and we saw some lower numbers then. But let's move on and look at the graphs. So there's bus during the 12 month period, and we're comparing here in blue, the 12 months from January, from July, 2019 to June, 2020, the uh, year ago, with in orange, the 12 months from July, 2020 to June, 2021. So uh, slightly higher availability of bus trips, moving from 97, 98% to just under 99% availability. Uh, O-Train line one, improving from 95% of trips provided to over 97%, O-Train Line 2 from uh, almost 100% to not operating, and the combined for the whole system moving up from 97.5% up to just under 99%. Um, very, again, this is something else that's influenced by, uh, by the pandemic because service availability depends on, on so many other things and with fewer cars, just as an example, with fewer cars on the road, there's fewer collisions on the road. There's fewer roads being closed as a result. Not as many bus trips need to be um, need to be uh, canceled because they're blocked by something on the roads. So a, a different influence of the pandemic. Let's go to the next slide, please. Uh, this is excess wait time. So this is our calculation of how much longer customers need to wait for their bus or train than they would if all the buses and or trains were running evenly spaced and we, this is our measure of uh, punctuality for frequent services so buses that run every 15 minutes or more frequently and all train service because it all runs every 15 minutes or more frequently uh, we'll go to the next slide now we'll go one more just uh, just a comment there that uh, uh, that some of the numbers came down because of repairs that we made. So what you see here is that we were quite steady during 2020, uh, January, February, March, a little higher in May, very good in June, and then very consistent in the blue bars, January to December. Then what you see is January, February, March, April of this year, the excess wait time being higher. Uh, some people had to wait on average or people needed to wait on average um, two minutes more than they should have if all the buses would have been running uh, perfectly evenly spaced, the buses and trains. And then you see that start to improve and go down again in May and June. And that's because in April and May, uh, we made schedule changes to respect the fact that there was not as much traffic congestion and you could take time out of the schedules because buses were not taking as long to get over the street or over the road from one uh, into the line to the other, and therefore were not um, uh, bunching up and running off schedule as much as they had when they were eight, when they were forced to uh, run well, not forced, but when they did run early at some stops uh, because of uh, the lower than previous um, amount of traffic congestion. So let's go to the next slide, please, which will be about on-time performance, and this is our measure for. Um, 
services that run every bus services that run every 16 minutes or less frequently. And here we just say it's, it's a binary thing. If the bus leaves the major stops along the line, uh, no more than one minute early and no more than five minutes after the time it's uh, on time. And if it is more than one early or more than five minutes late, it is not on time. And uh, we'll show you on the next slide the graph there showing the on-time performance being um, you know, just under 80% through all of those periods in, in orange. These are, this is the, the, not, the colors here mean something different. This is all for just the 12 month period we're reporting on. Orange bar shows buses that were on time. Blue bar shows buses that were early where we need to take um, corrective action, supervisory action to uh, ask the buses to uh, slow down a little or longer term planning action to schedule less time for the bus at that time. Uh, buses that are running late, those are the ones in gray. And you can see a lot of consistency across there. And those are ones where we take different action, different actions that are related to things like uh, reducing uh, friction on the road or increasing the amount of scheduled travel time that we give a bus to uh, complete its trip. Next slide, please. Uh, the next, uh, I think, is the final measure under the category of on-time performance is paratranspo on-time performance. What percentage of paratranspo trips were delivered during the 30-minute window that we uh, agreed with customers is when their trip would come? And that went very high during this year. You see, we'll show you the graph, but it went from 96% to between 98 and 99% uh, during the last 12 months. Next slide, please. And there you can see in orange, the 2021 number being very high, almost entirely re the result of uh, less traffic on the roads and also uh, if you were customers traveling. So therefore there's just more resources available, more buses available, or more buses and taxis available per, per uh, trip that's being made. So um, very, very high during the pandemic. But as you can see, uh, going back to previous years, um, our challenges are really in the, the winter time when, uh, when weather slows us down and mixes us in with, uh, with heavy traffic. But we'll move on to the next slide, please. And our, our measure of, uh, another measure of reliability is elevator availability. Um, the difference here is that at uh, older stations, older transway stations, there's usually one elevator at each location. And when it's down, that uh, counts against this measure. At the newer stations, especially the O-train stations, there's a pair of elevators. And when one is down, the other is there to back it up. Um, at transway stations, our eleva elevator availability was 98% over those months. Um, elevator availability at uh, O-Train Line 1 stations. I, we say effectively 100%. It was actually closer to 100% than it was to 99.9. .9. So it wasn't 100.000, but it was almost. And so we call it that effectively 100%. Now the next slide, please. There's that graph just showing that uh, elevator availability, um, a measure of reliability, but also a measure of accessibility is uniformly very, very high. Next slide, please. So that's the end of the measures. Uh, there's, as I say, there's much more detail in the, in the report, but also the caution that I'll recommend, or I'll, I'll repeat, is that because of the pandemic, uh, these are very hard to compare year to year. There, many of the outcomes are very heavily influenced by the pandemic, fewer customers, less, um, fewer calls, less traffic on the roads. Uh, but we will bring to you, of course, the next performance review, uh, which will cover the 12 months from January 2021 to December 2021. We'll bring that to you uh, next early next year once we have all the, the numbers from the second half of 2021 calculated. And what we'll be able to see there is another view of what a, a pandemic 12-month period has looked like. And uh, perhaps we'll see um, a little more, we can, we can hope that we'll see a little more uh, return of the economy, return to the transit system uh, through the, uh, the remaining months of 2021.
Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you, Pat, for all your hard work on this. It's, it's good, to, it's something this commission has wanted to do since the start of our mandate is to get back into good reporting of uh, what the performance indicators are. So I wanna thank you personally for your work on this. Um, Commission, we do have one speaker today. It's uh, Nick Grover. Uh, Nick, uh, whenever you're ready. Great, uh, can everyone hear me okay? We hear you fine. Okay, great. Uh, sorry about the location, but I uh, appreciate the time here. Um, yeah, so with regards to the report, uh, reading it over, it, it sounds very optimistic. Um, I just don't think it captures the reality for riders. Um, I think, of course, the ridership decline was affected the, by the pandemic. That's uh, indisputable, as it was in many cities. But I think I'd like to see more of this conversation be about policymakers taking ownership um, of the problems that we have. Any casual bus rider like myself uh, knows that late buses, no-show buses, um, un unreliable and sometimes infrequent surface can be the rule and not the exception of using OC Transpo. Um, and it's unfortunate that before and even as we come out of the pandemic, we're not seeing much of a plan to bring ridership not only back from pandemic levels, but far exceeding it which we need to be doing if we want to reduce uh, transport emissions, get people out of cars and using the bus by making it very reliable and easy to use. Um, I don't think the solutions are terribly difficult. Um, they are things like putting more buses on the high demand routes so that more people can access them more frequently, uh, dedicated bus lanes on the routes, uh, sections of really busy road and, and uh, choke points. You want comfortable and accessible service so it's attractive to people. Um, stops that are comfortable, easy to use, um, and affordable fares. Um, one thing that the group Free Transit Ottawa has advocated for, which I'm a member, is uh, free fares for those on ODSP and OW uh, who, who need it the most. It would save a lot of money. It would get people motivated to use transit when they need it. Um, so I think without fixes like this, we're really just giving riders a way to Uber and compelling people to buy cars when they can't depend on transport. Um, when routes are cut or service is just infrequent or you can't count on the bus to show up, um, that's a problem. And I appreciate that the stats look good, that there was a, an average of two minute wait, but I think that average hides the fact that on the extremes, you're having people maybe wait 15, 20 minutes or a bus doesn't show up. We have to focus on that extreme side, on those problems. Um, because high transport emissions are ultimately a symptom of transit that isn't reliable or attractive enough and it makes people use cars. I frankly have taken an Uber to doctor's appointments because I just knew the bus wouldn't show up. Um, of course, something turning riders away, unfortunately, again, is, is the LRT mess. Um, we really need to cancel that contract. A couple of community groups have called for it. We got to get the service up and running again. Uh, we got to take it in house, do it ourselves, just like the rest of transit. Um, I, I don't think we can purely measure things with the service availability metric. Um, we have to evaluate the service through the metric of what people need and what is attractive enough to them, uh, because right now it's not either. And um, yeah, uh, I'd like to see a report that is engaging from that side, actually talking to hundreds of riders, seeing what their feedback is their metric for success, for reliability, what would make them take the bus more? Drivers, what would make them get in the car? Um, so I think the commission, OC Transpo, we need to take some responsibility and ownership of the problem. Can't just blame the pandemic um, and not like, act like everything's going great. I would love to see more formal public participation in this, having actual riders and bus operators making some decisions with formal feedback in these meetings um, I'm really happy to see that there's a new transit GM. Um, and I'd like to say that the community is here. Uh, groups like Free Transit Ottawa, Ottawa Transit Riders, we have some great ideas. Um, we're willing to talk if you're willing to listen, because uh, we think we can do a lot better. Um, if you try and formalize our role in this process, or at least, at least talk to us, at least listen to us. Um, thank you, everyone, for your time. Hey, Nick, hold on. Uh, Commissioner Wright Gilbert has a question for you. Hey, Nick. Um, thanks for coming today. I, I really just 
really wanted to thank you for coming and probably waiting a really long time to speak. And I appreciate that. Um, if your video is going to make you go all choppy, you can turn it off. I won't be, I won't be offended. Um, so I think my question is this. So when you hear, when you read the report, I, I assume you've read it because you typically really keep up to date on these things. Um, and you hear the presentation uh, talking about sort of a really rosy picture of our, of our transit system, the buses especially, and, and line one, we already talked about that quite a bit today. Does it rub you the wrong way? Is that the sense that I'm getting from you? Am I getting that correctly, that it rubs you the wrong way, that it's being painted as this really rosy picture when people who actually use the service know that it is really the exact opposite? Well, to put it mildly, I was skeptical of the findings because as a rider and from every other rider I've heard from, um, it's the rule, not the exception for things to be very late, unreliable. So I can't say I trust the findings. I think it's probably, I'm not saying they're incorrect numbers. I'm saying it's probably a matter of the numbers maybe not presenting the side of things that we need to be looking at. So when I was talking about the average wait times, um, I think right. the average is a misleading number in this case. Um, right. You know, if, you know, sure, we're, we're providing the service that we, we decided that we would, um, but that's not good enough. You have to look at, okay, what do people need? What do they, what do they want? What do they need to get around the city very easily, very accessibly? That's got to be the metric. So I think probably the numbers are right, but I think it's just, it's approaching it from the wrong angle in my view. Um, right. And I think it needs to, I think if I think probably if riders and bus operators had the same data, you'd get a very different report and uh, you'd get very different feedback. Right. So if, for example, I, I agree with you that the av using an average number is is um, not necessarily indicative of reality. Right. So if if the report could include the lower end of wait time obviously being zero that would be the lower end um and the higher end of wait time the average higher end of wait time and then you know similarly with other with other averages that are presented would that be more realistic to you would you be more accepting of the report if it if it was if it included details such as you know what the averages of the higher end of the wait time for for customers or the num you know the average number of buses that are laid on a particular day um, or even stakeholder feedback that's been received, a summary of that. Is that, is that something that would, it would sort of be a good start to satisfy um, our riders when they're looking at this report? Because it does paint quite a rosy picture. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, I think just give us the whole data set. Uh, give us the raw numbers. Give us some graphs of, okay, here's what it looks at at the low end. Here's the middle and, and here's the extreme. That would be great. Uh, give us a median at least, a median number, I think would show a very different number than an average. Um, so yeah, that's one thing. Um, yeah, and I mean, I, I, think, I think averages in a transit system like this, just they're not gonna tell you the right picture. You, you have to look at either specific neighborhoods or specific routes, and that way you can assess, okay, here's what people are needing. Here's what people are looking for. Um, try to get a sense of, of what people are your potential riders because uh, these people are driving or they're taking Uber or they're biking because uh, you know they can't rely on the bus. So, so try and encapsulate that, you know, your potential rider base because we can expand it by a lot. Uh, every, every driver is a potential rider more or less is my view. That's great. Thank you so much for coming and, and taking the time, Nick, to, to speak to us. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Well, thank Chair, you. for my questions. Okay, thank you, uh, Commissioner Wright Gilbert and Nick. Thank you for your presentation. And uh, that's it. There's no other questions. So we're going to move on now to uh, any questions for staff on these reports. Commissioner Olson. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Pat, for the presentation. I really enjoyed that. Just a, just a couple of uh, uh, one comment and one question. I thought the report was good. I think it's a really good start. I think we can uh, build on it from here. Just that the injuries were measured in per million trips, but the crimes were measured in per 100,000 trips, which kind of, kind of gives a little bit of a, a different flavor to, to how many there were. If the crimes were per, per million trips, there would have been, the crime rate would have been 60, which is much more than the injuries. So I just, I just wonder about the choice of the, uh, the denominator in that. And then the other one, I just, 
uh, noticed in the crimes you had uh, crimes against persons, crime against property, and other uh, criminal code of Canada crime offenses. And I just, I, I couldn't figure out what would go in that third category. Can you give us some examples? Um, so I'll answer the first question first, but uh, while I get ready to the second question, I believe we have, yes, we do, uh, our Chief Special Constable, uh, Jim Babe, on the line. He'll be able to join and describe a little more of the uh, some of the um, uh, Criminal Code of Canada offenses that they enforce. Uh, so first I'll answer on the on the denominator and the reason it's different is uh, we're, we're working in all these cases to uh, maintain comparability with uh, measures that are being used across Canada and around the world so that uh, we can compare ourselves with other transit systems. Uh, so we're trying to maintain consistency as much as possible so that we can report to you and that ultimately so we can compare ourselves to other cities across the world and report to you on that and, and let you form opinions on where there's places that we might be able to do um, things differently in order to match uh, where other systems are or con on contrary, you might see some places where uh, because of the nature of our city or our system, uh, we're just uh, we're just in a different place than than other cities around the world. So that's uh, that's why we've chosen the the formulation of some of these measures that we have. Okay, Jim, you. babe, if you're there and online, can you come on and talk a little bit about uh, what the other Criminal Code of Canada categories would be that we're reporting in that number? Yes. Yeah, so. Uh... Uh, through the chair. Uh, the other criminal code uh, offenses are things like uh, outstanding criminal warrants. Uh, because special constables are peace officers, we have access to the Canadian Police Information uh, uh, Computer System, or CPIC. Uh, so it, it would relate to uh, uh, those individuals that we deal with when we check on them and they have warrants. Uh, things like disturb the peace, uh, you know, arguments, uh, um, domestic disputes, um, uh, anything to do with weapons, which we turn over to Ottawa police. Uh, that's what it, other criminal code offenses are uh, that we capture. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Appreciate it. Those are all my questions, Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Commissioner. Next up is uh, Councillor Gower. Uh, thanks, Chair. Uh, Pat, the crimes against property, does that include vandalism to bus shelters? graffiti or uh, broken glass? I'll ask I Jim to comment on the one. distinction between uh, what uh, those things that occur and what's a criminal code offense. So Jim, go ahead. Uh, yes, Councillor, that's exactly right. So uh, it, it includes mischief, which is damaged property to the shelters. Uh, if someone smashes a bus window, uh, graffiti, all that sort of thing on the system. Okay. Uh, the customer service contacts, um, are things like Twitter included in that? And how are you, what do you count as a customer service contact through something like Twitter? There's more, uh, more detail on that in the report than there is in my presentation. Um, and I'm looking for a window on the screen to, for me to open it quickly. Um, that report includes, uh, I'm just scanning down here in the report. Uh, ridership, customer service contacts. Uh, we've got a table four, document one, table four. I'm just going to go to that. I believe that's the one that shows the, the volumes that we have. No, that's figure four. Um, there we if go. It's, Pat, so, if it's broken down in the report, I, I can certainly refer to that in the interest of time. So okay. uh, figure figure seven in the report, which is uh, you know well down in the end, shows customer service contact by category, and then customer service contacts by type. We've got more information on that. Um, so we've got more than we obviously we're looking at as we allocate our resources. We're uh, looking at more than what we're reporting here, but we've got the number of uh, the number of emails we get, the number of uh, people who use the uh, text messaging service to get the next bus time, the number of uh, requests that we have, uh, the millions and millions of uh, API calls that we have every year to uh, collect the status of buses. Um, 
we've got, I, I don't know that we're measuring tweets perfectly or exactly the right way yet. We've got more more expert staff on board now than we had previously who know more about um, how to how to measure, uh, how to categorize positive and negative um, mentions on, on social media and things like that. So we're, we're moving into that area, but we don't have all of that there. What we've got here uh, that we are reporting to you in the, in the presentation is the things that, um, that we know we can measure well and that respond to the, uh, the decisions that were taken by the commission in what what measures we we could report to you. Some of the there's much more, you know. There's we'll probably measure a hundred thousand things. Um, we want to give you the ones that uh, you requested as being the top ten or twelve that'll help you in your uh, policy deliberation. Okay, thanks, uh, thanks, Pat. Um, you know, Mr. Grover, who spoke earlier, is right. We can't tell everything from these these high level reports, their, their averages, and a lot of things get smoothed out when you're talking about a system that has millions of riders. It's certainly not the only report or information or customer feedback that we, we have to consider. Um, I think these reports will become more useful once we have a few more months and years under our belt to compare against. They're, I think they'll be the most helpful when we can see start to see trends over many months or year over year. So. Um, looking forward to the next one. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Gower. Next up is uh, Commissioner Wright Gilbert. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, this is Commissioner. I'm pretty sure you know what I'm going to say based on my conversation with Mr. Grover. So, he's not wrong that this report sort of paints a really rosy picture of our of our transit service, right? I mean, it's like, oh, we're almost 100% or 98% when the rider reality is, is very different. And so part of my conversations that you heard, Mr. Grover, is that it might be more helpful if we include not only the averages, which I can, you know, I understand why they're included, but also perhaps some more contextual information with respect to late buses or buses that don't show up, customer wait times. Is, is that something that we're able to, is that context that, that can be put into this report to, because here's the thing, numbers without context are useless, right? They, they, can, they can be whatever you want them to be, right? You need the contextual information in there in order to, to make a determination um, to come to a conclusion. And, that, and that's my concern with this. Uh, well, so Mr. Chair, uh, I, I'd have to push back on that premise and say I don't agree. This does present an accurate picture of uh, how our transit system is operating across the entire city, across the entire 12 month period. And it is true when it shows that uh, waiting times are longer than we want them to be, that waiting times are longer uh, for, on average, for everybody across the period. And when Availability of service is good. It is good for everybody. What it doesn't do is uh, describe the uh, ways in which service failures have occurred. Uh, this is a performance reporting. This is not a you know this is not a diagnostic report. This is not our uh, what we use to manage the service. What we do every day is we're managing. We're spending most of our time managing. The failures, the ones that aren't showing up as positive then. So if you see a uh, 97% success rate on something, our transit control center is spending almost all of their time on dealing with the other 3% or what would have been the other 6% and taking a lot of work to bring it up, bring the service up to 97% to bring that, that failure rate down from a uh, theoretical 6% that I'm talking about. So what you see there is the result of all the work we've done. This is not uh, and, and it's not opinion based. It's not, it's not, we're not questioning, uh, you know, neither council nor, or, nor commission policy on where resources are allocated or what fares are or, and there's other work that the city does uh, to look at what's the total demand for transportation. This is purely about how did OC Transpo, how did we do at delivering the service that you, the Transit Commission, have asked us to provide during that 12-month period? And um, did we do well? And what are the places where we will be um, devoting more effort to bring those numbers 
up or down as appropriate to make them even more positive. Uh, my overall comment is that with so much being different during the pandemic, it is very hard to compare um, uh, compare these years to previous years. Uh, and uh, you know, ridership will come back, and we don't know how the economy will come back. And we all have our our um, hopes for the future. Um, this will retrospectively show what the ridership was during the 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 12 month periods before the next time and the time after that and the time after that that we report uh, so i would say that uh, you know many of the the service comments i can't comment on the policy questions that that mr grover talked about but the the aspects he said of what is good for customers what customers are looking for in a good service absolutely aligned with the trying to with the the service that we try to provide every hour of every day okay thank you for that um, so you and I had a discussion when this report was first proposed, you and I had a pretty lengthy discussion, um, lengthy meeting about the customer safety metric. And my suggestion was that measuring injury rates that require hospitalization or trips to hospitals and criminal code offenses was not necessarily a accurate measurement of customer safety. We had an entire conversation in, in commission about feeling safe. If you feel unsafe, then you are therefore unsafe. That is your reality, right? And so my suggestion was that we include metrics in the customer safety um, section with respect to, um, we have an anonymous online reporting where customers can actually report online anonymously about incidents or feeling unsafe on transit. And, and I had asked that those metrics be included and they weren't. Um, so I'm just raising it again, because while I can appreciate the work that, that the um, special constables do with respect to the criminal code and, and the, by, I think it's the bylaws too, um, you know, and I can appreciate that, that you know, injury rates are, are you know, how many required trips to hospital are probably far easier metrics. I think that we are ignoring that there are there are customers who you know feel unsafe on our transit system and therefore you know may not be so inclined to use it as often or ever. Um, and they're telling us that, but we're not reporting out on it. We have an entire system that was designed and is award-winning on where customers can report anonymously that they feel unsafe or were assaulted or. And we're not really reporting out on that. And so I just, I wanted to raise that again, because I think that it's a metric that we need to, even if it's just a metric of, we received X number of reports through the online reporting system. I think that it, it could really give us an idea of numbers of, of people who don't go through criminal code charges or bylaw charges or need to go to the hospital, but therefore are actually feeling unsafe on our system. So I just wanted to raise that again. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you, Commissioner. Next up is Councilor Kavanaugh, please. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, and uh, I certainly will echo um, what Commissioner uh, Wright Gilbert has just said. Um, it's something that um, I hear about um, as liaison for women and gender equity. Um, safety is a concern and, um, and I would like to be able to um, have a way of collecting that information. And by the way, I appreciate the report, I really do. Um, I think it's it's important, it, it's it's a base level. And I realize that um, you may say, well, how can you report how people feel? I, I think that we should look at this and I'm gonna challenge the uh, new general manager to look at this as well. Uh, I'm hoping with, uh, um, with coming in, um, you know, with your experience, uh, perhaps you might be familiar with this from the Montreal system, I don't know. But um, this is something that uh, I think we should we should look at, um, and um, so I appreciate the comments of my of my fellow commissioner. Um, one of the things about the statistics is, of course, when we're counselors, we hear about the the not so good stuff. Of course, that's nobody uh, calls us to tell us the bus came on time. Um, they tell us when it didn't. So um, of course, we have a skewed uh, view of of what what the world looks like in terms of um, the service and, and, and plus our own experiences. But 
um, but I, I just wanted to sort of point out the concern for um, routes that are, are not serviced as much and to make sure they're on time. I think they're, um, I don't know how to separate them, but for those that uh, might be in a nice, more isolated area where that's it, it's just that one bus. And if it's late, um, it's more problematic and um, versus um, a bus stop where you've got choices and other, you know, another different bus might come along that'll help you. Um, is there any way to distinguish those kind of routes? And of course, I'm hearing about routes that are not downtown routes that where uh, people have have issues. Uh, Mr. Chair, what I'd, I'd suggest uh, of the measures we uh, we've published here, uh, the best way to distinguish between those is to look separately at the excess waiting time from the on-time performance. The excess waiting time is for those uh, bus and train routes that run frequently, uh, and the the excess waiting to, and the on-time performance is for the routes that are less frequent. It says uh, 16 minutes or less frequent, but many of those are going to be buses that run every 30 minutes. So you'll see in the on-time performance calculation much more of the uh, evening, weekend, and, and non-central routes. And in the excess waiting time, you're really seeing a reflection of the rapid transit system, both the transit way and the trains. And, and the frequent routes that are running on streets like, you know, Montreal Road, Bank Street, Baseline, Carling. Um, and that's, so that's the, the best way of looking at, of separating the two. Uh, of course, we have, uh, uh, I won't say infinite, but huge amounts of data behind all these calculations. And that's what, uh, what we use all the time when we're doing uh, diagnostic work for service failures that we've noticed, service failures that you ask about or that, or that um, customers ask us about. That's when we're, as I say, that's where we spend most of our time is looking at the things that, that aren't going well. Okay, and, and I appreciate, and I appreciate all the time you give us uh, um, when, when uh, communities ask for information, you're there and I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Kavanaugh. Next up is uh, Vice Chair Cloutier, please. Thank you very much, uh, Chair, and thank you, Mr. Scrimger, for the report. Um, my question is, it, it, it relates to slide 27. I don't know if we want to pop it up, which has to do with <clears throat> buses that are late, but buses also that are early. And my question is this. There are routes where the timing is is different. It reflects different portions of the route. Uh, some are easier and more quickly to get through, and others perhaps a downtown route or uh, would on a regular basis be um, take more time to navigate. And I am wondering if in that context, uh, bus drivers and and some uh, some and I'm referring to the early because we don't want buses to be early. We don't want them to be late. Um, the bus the bus drivers uh, would advance on their schedule so that they are not late later. And my question is, how does that feedback get back to the schedulers at um, at OC Transpo from the drivers? And how often are the the, the um, bus timetables, not schedules, but timetables, adjusted? based on that feedback so that we minimize it, the amount of buses that are early without impacting and increasing buses that are late later in the route. Uh, so there's, uh, I'll answer, I'll provide a, a few pieces of information here. One is that there's many ways for that, that feedback to come back and there's a number of data sources that, uh, that uh, go into uh, setting not only the end-to-end -end, uh, scheduled running time, but also the section-by-section -section running time along the route. Uh, we make sure that there's that we're treating things separately. If there's a route that's going slow through an area and then quickly through another area, like a, a route like, uh, uh, say, Route 90 coming up from Councilor Brockington's area, many local stops through a residential area, then it picks up the transit way and goes quickly. We make sure that we're not, you know, we're applying different uh, different considerations to the, the local pickup zone rather than the fast zone. Um, those scheduled running times are based on uh, observations. As you know, we've got uh, GPS trackers on every 
every bus and those data. So every trip, every time the bus stops is all recorded. We're recording the location of a bus every 15 to 30 seconds, amassing huge amounts of data. The work then is to take these huge amounts of data and boil it down into decisions. Do we add a minute here? Do we add a minute over there? What's the best thing to do? Um, making sure that the bus is you know, tending towards, if there's a choice, we'd rather have it run a minute late than a minute or a minute after the posted time than a minute before the posted time, which is obviously the opposite of what you'd see on some other uh, types of transportation. Um, in addition to that, that gigantic amount of data, um, there is also regular feedback coming from the operators, supervisors, and controllers all the time. When they notice patterns, they're, they're, uh, they're feeding that into the system. There's also uh, regular meetings with uh, union representatives before each one so that they can pass on to us the comments that they've received just as we uh, receive the comments that have come in from customers to, to your offices. So all of these things come together. Um, it's a continuous process that is always going on. The schedules and the timetables are both updated four times a year uh, based on the best information that's available to that moment. Um, and one, the, the thing that's, uh, you know, when, when things are stable or are changing slowly, that's, that's very, you know, that we can, we can cope with that. We can predict the future. We can say, oh, things are getting slower on that route. Things are getting busier on that route. It looks like four months from now, we'll need another minute or four months from now, we'll need another, another bus or a bigger bus. When things are changing quickly, that can be very frustrating for people. So tons of that during the pandemic, but other things, a new apartment building opens, uh, the traffic conditions change, a new, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, a construction period ends, and all of a sudden there's more free flowing traffic on a road that might happen on such and such a day. And the customers and the bus operators are seeing that every day and are dealing with that circumstance. And it's not until the next quarterly change that we can uh, incorporate that into the, into the bus timetables. The other aspect of all of this uh, just very quickly is that um, our controllers, our supervisors and our operators are all working together to uh, decide what's the best thing to do in the actual circumstance when the bus is is running a minute early is it to uh, stop mid block is it to slow down a little uh, is it to let the, you know let that light go red in front of you so you can lose a little bit of time and as you do that um, you have to you know we all need to understand that there's customers on board who are saying things to the operator like why are you slowing down why are you sitting here can't we get going? I just need to go to the next stop. Can't you get me there and then take your corrective action? So our operators are dealing with all of these pressures and making those decisions in, in real time. And, and the rest of us are working to get them schedules that support them as much as we can as they make those, those instantaneous calls. Thank you, Mr. Scrimger. Your answer is complete and, and contextual as always. And, and my question, you know, how does the feedback come back and how, how is that feedback um, used? And, and, uh, and I appreciate your, uh, your answer today because we, we want them to be on time as much as possible, given the circumstances. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. That's it. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Vice Chair. And thank you uh, again, Mr. Scrimger. Uh, okay, so that looks like the end of the answers to staff. So is this report received? Received. 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 Thank you. Uh, are there any notices of motion? Okay, seeing none. Inquiries, I believe, Commissioner Wright Gilbert, you have an inquiry today? I do, Mr. Chair. And if, uh, if it's all right, I'll just read it into sure. the record Absolutely. and then I'll and then I'll send it to the um, commission coordinator. Okay. Uh, so as per its stated mandate, the Transit Commission, including citizen members, is responsible for ensuring this development of a safe, efficient, accessible, and client-focused transit system, and for providing overall guidance and direction to the Transportation Services Department on all issues relating to the operation of public transit, including conventional bus service, the O-Train, and Paratranspo. At the beginning of their term, citizen commissioners are required to sign an oath of office and a comprehensive non-disclosure agreement under the Municipal Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act. 
Citizen commissioners are required to make decisions, provide advice, and vote on motions in the same capacity as their council commissioner colleagues. With the above outlined information in mind, I am asking city staff to provide in writing the reasons for the following. Excluding citizen transit commissioners from in-camera briefings at FEDCO related to the ongoing issues with the Confederation line and excluding tra citizen transit commissioners from viewing documents related to the Confederation line that are not released publicly as a result of the, as a result of the project agreement um, for an example, as an example, RTG's return to service plan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Wright Gilbert. Is there anybody else with inquiries today? Okay. Uh, then we, is there any other business? No, okay. Then uh, Vice Chair, a motion to adjourn, please. That the proceedings of the Transit Commission of October 20th be adjourned. Carry. Thank you all. So, all right, uh, some updates here for you. The next regular meeting will be on Wednesday, November 3rd, uh, 2021. That's the special meeting that we do a half hour after the budget is tabled at council. And uh, just to remind everybody, it's uh, the purpose of that meeting will be just to table our budget. We won't get into detailed questions of the budget at that meeting. There will be another meeting where we will dissect the budget and make motions to amend or whatever you want to do with the budget. Okay, and um, it, uh, when we have more news on the technical briefing that the uh, city manager talked about, that'll get circulated to everybody. And uh, so thank you all for today, much appreciated. And the media availability will be at uh, 4.50, I guess. So thank you. Thank you, merci. Thank you.